the burden on them, reducing the bureaucratic burden on them, is only to be welcomed and is thoroughly desirable, whilst ensuring that multinationals pay taxation according to law is also desirable. It is always worth remembering that tax avoidance is perfectly legal. If a tax is being avoided, it is for this House to change the law so that it has to be paid. It is not some moral virtue to pay more tax than the law requires, and therefore removing loopholes is much to be uh, commended. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, this happy picture does not continue uh, in its entirety, for though I am fully supportive of the broad thrust of what the Chancellor is doing, and I think he has got it right, and I think that most of his tax measures are welcome, and his changes to personal taxation especially welcome. That is an area where I would like him to go further. I think having made £8 billion on cutting income tax at the top rate from 50p to 45p in the pound, he should go further in an exuberant like fashion and cut it back to the rate that Gordon Brown had it throughout his period as Chancellor. But the area where I find my most disagreement, Madam Deputy Speaker, is on page 19 of the Red Book, where is set out the economic opportunities and risks linked to the UK's membership of the European Union. And I am delighted that the nationalists, who so much crave independence for themselves, nonetheless wish to be shackled to the European Union. It is one of their idiosyncrasies that many of us find so charming. Um, but if I may come to this extraordinarily tendentious page, a page strewn with errors, overstatement, over-egging of pudding, I should like to do so. And we will start with the very first line. Membership of the EU has increased the EU's openness to trade and investment. That is entirely disputable. In fact, all it has done has put us in a customs union with very high levels of regulation and a high external tariff. The tariff on dairy products coming into this country is 42 per cent, much to the disadvantage of our friends uh, in New Zealand. So it hasn't made us more open. It has closed us uh, to some areas. And it goes on. The UK's full access through to the single market clearly increases the openness of the British economy. Well, there's a word for that, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's balderdash, that what the, what the access to the single market does is put the dead hand of regulation on the 95 per cent of British businesses that never trade with the continent. They are suffering from these regulations. Their business is made harder to do. It's nothing to do uh, with openness. It's to do with burdens. And then there's a bit which I think shows the Chancellor's wonderful and sophisticated sense of humour. He says that on February 2016 at the European Council, the Prime Minister, my right honourable friend, secured a new settlement for the UK in a reformed EU. Well, it has to be said the EU was most certainly not reformed at that Council, and our settlement in it was so small as to be hardly noticeable and gave away at the same time our ability to veto any treaty for fiscal union to follow the monetary union. We said we would do nothing to obstruct that. So we gave away our strongest negotiating hand for nothing, for thin gruel. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. It's always a pleasure to listen to the Honourable Gentleman come forward to the House and make his contribution, and we, we enjoy it very much. But is he, is, does he agree with me that one of the things that the Prime Minister didn't secure was anything for the fishing sector whatsoever, uh, and, and very little for the farming community? And does he agree when it comes to getting a settlement, he should have went with, it, with those two issues at, at the forefront of his...